Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 9 in our ongoing series on John Bonet Ramsey. As promised yesterday, this episode will be dealing with John Bonet's medical records. Now, there's a lot to go into in this area, but we're going to stick to sort of the low hanging fruit, which is just to sort of ask the question. Was John Bonet neglected, right? Does do the medical records sort of reinforce this notion of neglect? And so far what we've already covered in this series of eight episodes before this one, we've sort of looked at the dog and asked the same question. Was the dog neglected? We've looked at what the housekeeper said. Linda Hoffman Pugh, and she spoke about responsibility, right? And you might think, well, what does that actually mean, that the kids weren't given more responsibility? And I think one area that we can sort of look at is bedwetting. You know, I actually watched a video of um, Shanann Watts kind of rewarding her daughter, Bella, for not sucking her thumb. And her, her daughter's... I think I think she was about four years old turning five and at the same time she was also singing Cece's praises for that for the fact that she hadn't um, had an accident in her words I think in two weeks and so that is kind of one aspect of giving children responsibility is kind of in terms of their excrement and I can you might laugh but you know, my dog is my my puppy has got responsibilities in that area as well, and my puppy is not even a year old, and he's already sort of learned. Not that I kind of enforced it, but he's already kind of learned to <clears throat> do his business outside of my garden. So if I take him for a walk, he tends to sort of do that. It might just be that when he's running around and exercising, that he has a bowel movement, but the other thing is that he just doesn't he doesn't seem to, to go um, in the garden. It's quite a small garden, and, and he did go in the beginning, but he doesn't do that anymore. And so he has also uh, been given some responsibility and taken it on, right? Obviously, that also includes inside the home. And I think something like a, a dog or a puppy, you might think it's, you can't make the comparison, but a dog or a puppy needs to be taught not to have accidents inside the home in the same way that children need to be taught not to have accidents when they're sleeping or in a bed situation. And this, this is what is quite a strange area in the Ramsey case is that it wasn't just John Bonet, but a brother as well were bedwetting and kind of worse at the age of six and nine respectively. And so what is that telling us? What is what is that telling us about that? Then um, I think you've also got to ask, you know, about responsibility in terms of meals. You know, what food are you eating? What food are you cooking? What, um, what sort of diet are, are you giving your children? That's also got to do with responsibility in terms of parenting I guess and then what is the family sort of mentality like in terms of one another you know it's the interrelationships in terms of if we're talking about neglect are the interrelationships between family members also um, protected are they also addressed and if we look at the Watts case one thing that we can see from a mile away in the Watts case was the fact that Chris Watts was having an affair meant that he was sort of neglecting his family as a whole. He was neglecting his wife, certainly, but he was also sort of neglecting his children, and his children felt that. And um, one's kind of got to ask, if we're asking the question about neglect, could there have been an affair in the Ramsey case? Another thing to sort of just ask in a general way is protection. So neglect isn't only about preventing certain kinds of activities like bedwetting. 
It's also about protecting um, children from harm, right? So in the Watts case, Shanann protected Cece from harm in terms of Nutgate, right? And so was there some kind of something gate in the Ramsey case where there was a protection or not protection in a particular area? And I, I would argue that there was possibly Golfgate where John Bonet was struck on the cheek by a golf club and this was just before her birthday or on her birthday. I think it was the previous year, 1995, I could be wrong. And it was sufficient that she required plastic surgery. But in a general way, the question we're asking is, in this episode is, did the medical, do the medical records tend to reinforce a scenario of neglect or do they show that she wasn't neglected? Now, before we go into it, I think you've got to be quite clear what you are asking. Um, you know, is it benign neglect? In other words, is it, for example, let's, let's compare to having a dog at home. If I take my dog for a walk every day, but I otherwise ignore him completely, that you might say that that is benign neglect in the sense that it's not it's not abuse it's not um it's not like um it's not to that to that extreme but it's still neglect right and the other side where i think one can compare that to is if i take my dog for a walk every day from the perspective of everybody else from the outside world from the perspective of an audience it looks like i'm a good dog handler because there he is walking his dog again, right? But one could also compare that to pageants. Seeing John Bonet in pageants all the time, an audience sees her and she's she's doled up and she's her mother is fussing around her. But what about just ordinary situations at home? What about just the day to day non pageant stuff? And this is where the medical records sort of come into play, where you say Beyond the pageantry, which is obviously not um, neglect, it's possibly the, the opposite, it's kind of fussing. And one can also ask, was that kind of attention good for John Bonet? That this kind of superficial attention based on sort of, you know, doing your hair and wearing a certain kind of dress. I think there's a part of that that John Bonet really enjoyed. But I think it could also be... You know, it's not um, ingratiating herself in her mother's attention. It is sort of intended to impress other people. And I think social media today kind of has that element where you might feel in the beginning when someone takes a photo of you or, you know, a selfie with you and the other person, you might feel in the beginning flattered and, and that you're getting their attention only to find later on that, they're using you to get someone else's attention. It's a means to an end. And then, then you might not feel so interested in participating in that when you realize you're not really a factor in, in, a, in a personal, intimate, warm way. Does that make sense? So these are all questions and speculations that we are testing on our way to the incident, which is now exactly a week away. And so... In to today's episode, as I say, we're going to look at the medical report. I will also refer to some news articles in the description. I really recommend you read them because they show a discrepancy between the experts, between John Bonet's pediatrician and the pathologist on what exactly was going on there. So that is really worth, worth checking out. Before we get to the medical report, if you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. You can click on the blue icon at the bottom right of the screen. Please like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So once again, I'm going to do a sort of preliminary overview of the medical report from looking in perfect murder perfect town and that is actually on page 332 to about 335 
and uh, we're just going to kind of gloss over some of it. Um, the, the fact that there are, it's sort of part of the timeline. You can sort of go through the medical report as a timeline in its own right, okay? Now, although the narrative, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, on page 333, talks about things like child molestation and physical abuse, I don't even want to go there. I kind of just want to address the question of neglect, right? In other words, I want to open the first door, and the first door is neglect. And as I say, we've already looked at John Bonet's pet dog. We've looked at what the housekeeper said, although not in... A heck of a lot of detail and now we're going to go into the medical records and there's more to take on in terms of this particular topic but let's take it step by step so in terms of the treatment history which uh perfect murder perfect town summarizes between page 335 and 336 it basically just refers to john benet starting off as a patient in late 1991 so i think at that point she was almost two years old around about two years old then in this on December 6 1991 she had a fever a cough and she was wheezing and it's interesting that that happened over Chris not Christmas but the festive season so kind of in winter and again you can sort of ask you know did that happen because of um, parties or specifically or, or was it because other things were going on bear in mind um, Patsy developed cancer I think it was around 1993 though and that could also in other words if you even want to make the argument that there could have been neglect you could also argue well it was justified because Patsy was ill herself right so we're just trying to find out kind of what happened. Then uh, for the next six, sorry, the next 10 months following that uh, first doctor's visit, um, she, John Bonet had the usual colds and coughs of a toddler. By the time she was two and a half years old, she developed a history of, of coughs accompanied by low-grade fever. So that is not not looking good so far in terms of you know was she well taken care of just in a general way right um on in july 1993 patsy has cancer and john bonnet was living with her grandmother and and then what she was suffering then was a kind of a regression in terms of her eating habits and also her toileting right so you can see that there was a period of that that you could argue was somewhat problematic before 1993 and then the question is did it continue in other words once patsy was in remission what happened after that When John Bonnet was three years old and one month, her, her buttocks were chafed red from diarrhea, as was her vaginal area. Um, two months after that, so when she was three years old and three months, she had a cough and a stuffed nose. She was suffering from poor sleep, grouchy from fatigue, bad breath. And, um, you know, I think if you add all of those things together, um, sick, sleep deprived or suffering from insomnia, um, bad breath, not brushing her teeth, poor sort of self-maintenance, that does seem to just add up to an overall picture of a neglected child. And again, we can still look at this with some compassion and say the Ramsey family were... Um, sort of undergoing a state of of trauma tension anxiety stress based on um, Patsy's health challenges right but the the fact is that based on this it does look like 
John Binet wasn't getting the sort of care and attention that she needed. And you can kind of look at this and say, forget all the pageant stuff. Pu pu push the pageant stuff aside. The clothing, the photo shoots, the, you know, doing her nails and hair and all that kind of thing. Just take care of the child. Make that the first priority, right? The other thing to note was that when she was uh, three years and three months old, she was still drinking from a bottle. And that again, I think, brings up this topic of giving the children responsibility. And part of that is teaching them independence, teaching them how to function in a somewhat autonomous way, right? I don't know what is absolutely typical these days in terms of that, drinking from, from a bottle, um, but obviously once you go to kindergarten, I, I don't think any children are really still drinking from their bottles then, um, you know, at the age of sort of four years old and five years old and that sort of thing. And um, that tends to be, I think, the absolute sort of finishing line with drinking from a bottle. You know, that once you go to school, then you've, you've moved beyond that stage. Anyway, we then go to October 1994. So I was out by about a year. Um, John Bonet had a scar on her left cheek from being hit with a golf club. And... Um, at that time, she was wearing pull-ups because of bedwetting. So I think that is quite interesting that that happened. When that happened, she was still experiencing stress to the extent that she was still bedwetting. Um, something else just to bring up here is, I don't know whether that date is correct, October 1994. John Bonet's birthday was in August, and we know that this incident occurred in Charlevoix, and we know that they were in um, Charlevoix in August 1994. So I kind of have it the date a little bit earlier, very close to her birthday. Then May 1995, John Bonet fell and landed on her nose. And that was also quite a um, serious injury. Seven and a half months later, she tripped and hit her head above her left eye and still reports of a stuffy nose, bad breath and a cough. Now now we are sort of into the final stretch. It's now kind of 1996, right? And if you kind of go through this timeline, it's sort of, it's every year is kind of populated with incidents. And the incidents sort of vary between sickness and injury and kind of malaise just in terms of things like not sleeping well bad breath and that kind of thing right so it's just a, a, a kind of a general sense of 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 stress and and kind of tension does that make sense in march 1996 she went in for a cough two months after that so in may um she bent the nail back on the left hand in another fall, right? Three months before her death, Pat Patsy Ramsey told the doctor she was a good sleeper, easy to put to bed, easy to wake, not interested in opposite sex, behaved modestly in public, um, didn't engage in sex play with her friends, but she was asking about sex roles and reproduction. Now, I don't really know whether that is normal for a six-year-old child. I, I, I can't really say. Um, I don't know what you guys think about that. I think you've also got to ask, why did that subject come up then? Three months before her death. Then two months before her death, she had a stuffy nose and bad breath, allergies and rhinitis. Now, again, if you look at all of this, you might say, yeah, well, you know, people get the sniffles. People get catch colds. Um, some children are more sickly than others, but seems a bit much doesn't it all of these things and you know you could sort of argue well patsy may have been hyper vigilant and took john bonnet to the doctor every time she was ill and you could argue that 
you know, the fact that she took her to the doctor was her looking out for John Bonet, that it was her taking care of John Bonet. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if you can make that argument. I think something like bedwetting is something you don't take a child to the doctor for. I think it is something you've got to manage at home. And you don't manage it by just simply taking care of the the, the sheets and washing the sheets and putting the, the child in a certain kind of diaper. I don't think that's the way it's done. I think it, it needs to be done in a in a different way. And I don't think that... Um, you know, I think Patsy did read books about it and I think Patsy was trying to educate herself on it. I just think that her attention was sort of separated and you know it was like too little butter over too much bread so so um i'm kind of just suggesting that perhaps patsy was over committed to lots of things lots of events lots of work you know like whether it was charity work or whatever it was and maybe um not not invested enough or not um, effective enough in terms of what is going on at home and she may have also just thought things will work themselves out right perhaps she was a bit embarrassed about admitting some of the things she was dealing with and um, you know given that Patsy is quite a proud lady quite a um, sort of a prissy well-dressed person where appearances really mattered and so this thing was probably quite embarrassing you know urine and feces and and whatnot and so you didn't really want to address it um, because it wouldn't make her look particularly good and so you would sort of hide it away p perhaps then um, on November 12th 1996 so about six weeks before her death, she had a runny nose, cold sores, and was sneezing. So you've kind of got to think between these photo shoots, between these pageants, is actually a sick child. It's, it's sort of between the big smiles and the performances is a little girl who is having very basic um, issues. And I can almost compare it to some of the travails models have where they are beautiful and kind of uh, admired and, and all that kind of thing, yet they suffer from issues, some, quite a lot of them suffer from issues of their self-image, um, self um, their sense of their own body, you know, um, being comfortable in their own skin kind of thing. Um, they're having eating disorders possibly, um, having, some, it could be drug um, addiction or some kind of some kind of affliction, and that is then covered over with makeup and and smiles and and Photoshop kind of thing. I'm just saying there's this weird dichotomy between the fairy tale, the the beautiful thing that you're seeing, and the ugliness that it covers over, the the dysfunction that it covers over. Um, and sometimes the more beautiful something is, the more dysfunctional, the, the more the need to discover, to, to, to um, cover over the underlying dysfunction. Quite a good example of that that's sort of coming out now is Princess Leia. Carrie Fisher was a really s stunning um, movie star at the age of 19. She was um, seen very widely as a kind of a sex symbol and, and very, um, she, she was quite a, she was kind of an icon and she still is. And so would she really want to admit that things were very dysfunctional? Well, she did later on in her life. But again, you kind of have this thing where everyone is admiring you. you how, how can you kind of admit that some of the basic things aren't there? And in her case, that included also, in Carrie Fisher's case, that also included just, you know, proper quality um, love and affection from other family members, right? And I think 
part of Carrie Fisher's story is also her father having an affair and things like that. Anyway, then three weeks after her runny nose, cold sores and sneezing. So this takes you into the first week of, uh, sorry, the first week of December 1996. Um, John Bernays' eyesight was checked. And I don't know what that was about. I don't know whether she um, had a fall or whether she wasn't sleeping enough or whether perhaps she just needed glasses. I don't know. But that was definitely, you know, something new that happened kind of quite recently. Then early in December 1996, she was sick but didn't go and see the doctor, which I think is quite interesting. Um on page 336 of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, Dr. Buf is quoted telling a reporter covering the story that John Bonet had an average number of physician visits for a child her age. Now, you can make of that what you will. You might say that that is true. It was an average number of visits. Um, it's difficult to answer that. You, on the one hand, you could say because she was from a privileged family, they had the kind of ability to and the resources to take her to the doctor often. And even if it was a minor complaint, they would take her. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether that passes the smell test, especially because John Bonet had some quite serious things wrong with her. You know, the bedwetting isn't something that the average child would be going through for as long as she was going through. The fact that her mother had cancer when she did wasn't the average situation for most children. Um, some of the injuries she suffered, you know, including plas having plastic surgery, wasn't the average thing. And then the sort of, it's not really recidivism, but the, the sort of um, re repetitive things that were going on. It wasn't just like one... Um, incident or one um, kind of uh, you know one instance of something happening such as bad breath it was quite a few and th that kind of makes you wonder wh what is going on here I don't know whether you can compare a child to a to a little puppy but I mean it is quite new for me I haven't had a, a dog before and you know, I took my dog for four, uh, on, on four sort of routine visits to the vet. And um, at one point, my dog swallowed a coin, which I thought was going to be kind of requiring perhaps emergency surgery. But besides that, um, you know, I've had him for almost a year and he's sort of never really been ill. And um I haven't either. I mean, I haven't been to the doctor once this year, touch wood. So, you know, going to the doctor something like 30-something times over that period seems a bit excessive, doesn't it? The housekeeper kind of affirms the story that you get from the medical report, which is that one of the primary areas of concern was bedwetting. The fact that it was chronic, the fact that it was constant, and the fact that it was just sort of allowed to go on, like over and over again. And, you know, it's one thing to say, well, okay, there was bedwetting. I think an aspect that that is easy to overlook is if you have two children bedwetting at the same time, constantly, what is going to happen? And the answer is, well, when they wet their bed, and if they wet their bed every night, what's going to happen? Well, they aren't they going to then get into another bed? Aren't they going to leave their wet bed and sleep in another bed? And if both children are doing at this, at doing that at the same time, what situation could could you be sort of fomenting in that scenario, right? So anyway, according to oh, and then in terms of um, winter. You know, something like a, a wet bed in winter is far worse because it's cold and it's unpleasant. And so even more so, you'd want to not be lying in a, in a wet bed 
in a situation like that. Another situation could also be, what if the, the sheets aren't always washed? So in other words, you wet your bed, the sheets aren't always washed. Now both beds are, are um, you know, urinated on. And then you can, couldn't you potentially reach a situation where you're running out of beds for two children, even in a big house? Anyway, Linda Hoffman Pugh on page 237 of Murder, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town uh, talks about the summer of 96. So midway through 1996, uh, the housekeeper says John Bonet started wearing those diaper type underpants pull ups. She even wore them to bed and there was always a wet one in the trash. And then she goes on to say, by the end of the summer, Patsy was trying to get her to do without them. So to Patsy's credit, she was trying to wean her. She was trying to, you know, um, uh, help John Bonet get over her bedwetting. And then um, she says, then John Bonet started wetting the bed again. Almost every day I was there, there was a wet bed. Patsy said she doesn't want uh, to continue using pull-ups. And so she just put a plastic cover on the bed. No big deal to her. And these are Linda Hoffman Pugh's words. That the bedwetting eventually was no big deal to her. And that's something that's also reinforced in, I think, the, the police interviews where when they were asked about the bedwetting, they both John and Patsy kind of shrugged it off, saying, no, nah, it wasn't really an issue. It wasn't really, you know, John didn't really get involved, and Patsy didn't really kind of get involved either. It was just, you know, just do the laundry and get on with your day kind of thing. And anyway, Linda Hoffman Pew continues saying, by the time I'd come in in the morning, Patsy would have all the sheets off the bed and in the laundry. John Bernays, um, John Bernays, I think, meaning her, her, her um, blanket, her white blanket would already be in the dryer. And I think that is the blanket she was eventually found in. The Ramses had to had two washer dryers, one in the basement and a stackable unit in the closet, just outside John Bernays' room. So the part that I want to just re-emphasize here is the question is does it look like from the medical records that there's some kind of neglect that could have been going on and that the answer what do you think the answer is to that because what we know for a fact is that the grand jury voted to indict both parents on this issue on um on neglect that it was either neglect or something else and once again, you can say, so what? You know, so what if they neglected her a little bit? That doesn't add up to what ultimately happened to her. But if you turn that question around, could, you could potentially ask, couldn't that open the door to something potentially happening to her? In other words, what happened to John Bonet was that an accident or was an accident waiting to happen? Was what happened to John Bonet something that was really so shocking, really so unexpected? Or was it something that was kind of um, the the Ides were sort of being positioned, the um, you know the, the chips were sort of falling in a way that was making what is going to ultimately happen happen? It's a question, and I do think one's also got to ask. If John Bonet was neglected and John Bonet was kind of the apple of her mother's eye in terms of the pageants, what about her brother? What is that like for him? Anyway, thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do. Like, share, leave a comment and I'll see you guys next time.